We turn to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Hebrews 6, verses 1 through 8. Now hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection or to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible for those who once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Thus is the reading of God's word. Let's pray together. Almighty Father in heaven, we give you great thanks and praise that we can gather around your sacred scripture. This word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It is mighty, it is powerful. It can break our hearts, it can shatter our illusions. It can show us who we really are and help us understand you better. We ask this morning, Lord, that you would do that. That you, by your spirit, would come and work through us, work through me, work through the weak vessel, that your word might be preached faithfully, and that people might be changed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So I took several mission trips to New York City when I was in high school. And in fact, I'm here. One of the reasons I'm here is because of one of those mission trips. That's a story for a different time. But I took several mission trips to New York City. And you would go to New York City, and there was these huge playgrounds with basketball courts. And I mean, this is a huge deal in New York City. It's a huge deal in Chicago as well but in New York City especially. And there would be guys on these playgrounds who were like NBA quality players. And kids, people would gather there in the evenings, in the afternoons, and they would sit in the stands. You would have hundreds of people there to watch a playground game of basketball. And these guys would come and they would shoot and they would dunk and things like that. I remember when I was there, we would walk by these things and watch them. And I always wondered why. There's these great guys there. Great ability. Why are they on a playground? Why are they not in the NBA? Why are they not doing that? And so I began to look at it, research it, talk to people about it. And the bottom line was they could not discipline themselves to use their abilities well over the long haul. They squandered their gifting. Yes, they could come out and play on a Thursday afternoon and light it up one Thursday afternoon, but they couldn't show up at practice day in and day out. They couldn't submit to coaches week in and week out. They couldn't discipline themselves to stay away from bad company. They squandered the privileges they had. They squandered their abilities. So instead of playing in the NBA or playing in overseas, even that's better than where they were at, they're making, barely making ends meet, playing on a playground in front of a few hundred people. This morning, I want to warn you not to be like that. We have all been given great covenant privileges. All of us here have been given great covenant privileges. Will we squander those? Will we waste those? Will we take what God has given to us, all the good gifts he has given to us, and will we throw them away like those men have thrown away their gifts? And I'm sure if you think in your own fields, whether it's school or friends of yours, you know friends like this. What I'm encouraging you with this morning is the basic point of this sermon is we must press on to maturity so we do not squander the covenant gifts, the blessings that we have been given by God. And that's the basic point of the sermon. Because if we do squander them, guess what? You burn. That's the point. You burn. That's the end of the passage. Okay. So let's look at this passage. The passage is basically divided up in two sections. Verses 1 through 3, press on to maturity. Verses 4 through 8, watch out for apostasy. It even rhymes almost. Okay? You press on to maturity, watch out for apostasy. Okay? So remember, this is part of a continuing section that began in 5 verse 11 really and it goes over into 612 okay so 511 to 612 is one large chunk of text okay and this is the third warning passage we've got the first one's in hebrews 2 where it says let, let us not drift away and then the second one it's hard to know where it begins and where it ends but the second one is three and four basically a warning about entering into the rest and not being like those who refuse to enter the promised land this is our third warning passage. And then we'll get another one in chapter 10. 
Um, it's very similar to this one here in chapter 6. We have a lot of similarities here. So remember, this is a warning. He's saying, you've been immature. You're still stuck in the milk stage. And I need you to move on. And that's where verse, six, verse 1 begins. Therefore, connect it back up. Therefore, because we want to be mature, because we don't want to be stuck in the milk stage, because we don't want to be unskilled in the word of righteousness, therefore, let us leave the discussion of the basic principles, the rudimentary principles of Christ. Let's go on to maturity. Let's press on to maturity. Not laying again the foundation. So we talked about this a lot a couple sermons ago. We're not, we're not to keep laying a foundation. We're to keep laying uh, the basics down over and over and over again. And part of the problem with this congregation is they have forgot the basics. They forgot the rudimentary principles. They have forgotten the lay of the land. The basic principle of the Christian faith. And he goes on to kind of elucidate these or lay these out here. And he, there's three pairs Repentance, faith toward God, first pair. Baptism, laying on the hands, second pair. And resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment, third pair. So it's basically three pairs here. Okay? And the first pair obviously goes together. Repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. Okay? Repentance from dead works here does not mean repentance from the works of the law. It doesn't mean that those works. Dead works are works like immorality, bitterness, anger, pride, all those sins. Okay? This is basic Christian living. We need to repent of those dead works and have faith toward God. Okay, two sides of the same coin. Then he says the doctrine of baptism, the laying on of hands. Now there's a lot of discussion about this. What exactly is this doctrine of baptism? What exactly is this laying on of hands? Some people think it refers to Old Testament washings. Okay, which in the Old Testament, a lot of the washings were called baptisms. And later in Hebrews, he uses that same exact word to indicate washings, Old Testament washings. Okay? And it could mean that. Um, it could mean that. It certainly could. That could be in the background. But I think this is talking about the entrance into the Christian life. And it's talking about baptism and the laying on of hands that often happened at baptism. Okay, it's not talking about ordination. It's talking about the laying of hands that happened at your entrance into the church, becoming part of the body of Christ. So you have this conversion, repentance, faith toward God, entrance into the church through baptism, laying on of hands, and all that's associated with the Holy Spirit, which will show back up here in verse 4. And then you have the end. Judgment and resurrection of the dead. Okay. So you basically move through the entire Christian life here. From repentance to judgment. Final judgment. The whole thing. And he's saying these are the foundation stones. These are the basics of the Christian life. And John Calvin thought that maybe these were even part of sort of a new members class for Jews. Yeah, that's kind of John Calvin's take on it. Here, if you're a Jew, and a lot of this has Jewish imagery, which you would expect in a book like Hebrews, a lot of Jewish imagery and Jewish background, okay? So John Calvin thought maybe this is sort of like a, he didn't use the phrase new members, obviously that wasn't how they viewed it. But the idea was that here's some Jews and they want to come into the church and here's kind of the basics you have to teach them. Okay? Repentance, faith toward God, baptism, resurrection of the dead, those sort of things, okay? So he's saying... We need to stop laying this foundation. Now, he's not saying ignore it. Let me just repeat this again. I said it a couple weeks ago. Let me repeat it. He's not saying ignore the foundation. He's not saying throw the foundation away. He's saying, okay, let's not stick here. The point of building a foundation is to put a house on top of it. Okay? If you go by and you see a, a concrete slab poured, you know, that looks like a house, and you go by six months later and it's still a concrete slab, and you go by six months later and it's still a concrete slab, you say, well, somebody messed that up. A concrete slab pretty is, is not very good, not worth a whole lot. It's just there. The whole point of building the foundation is to build on top of it. The whole point of laying a foundation is to build on top of it. Okay? So the author is saying we must press on to maturity. We've got to build on top of these things, and that's what he's going to try to do with the doctrine of Melchizedek. Okay? We've got to build on top of the foundation. Now why? Why is this so important? Okay? Why do we have to press on to maturity? And the answer comes in verse 4. The reason we have to press on the maturity is because if we don't, we will find ourselves in the position of an apostate. Here's the basic connection. If you don't press on the maturity, you will find yourself falling away. That's the idea here. Now notice the shift in tone. Verses 1 through 3 are we, us. Verses 4 through 8 are they. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. So he shifts his tone a bit, as a good pastor does from time to time. He's not saying you guys have apostatized. He's not saying that. But he's saying there are people who have, and you don't want to be like them. And he's warning them. And he says, 
It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit if they fall away to renew them again to repentance. It is impossible. And that word impossible, it means impossible. <laughs> That's exactly what it means, all right? Some of the people, you read commentary, like, well, we're not sure about this word impossible. We think maybe it doesn't mean that. Maybe there's like a little opening here, a little door. No, no, let me show you. Words used several times already in Hebrews. And, um, for example, Hebrews 6, if I'm not, 618. It's used in 618, okay? That by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. Now, we're going to get to this in a couple of weeks. But the whole point of this is that God's word is absolutely sure. If it doesn't mean impossible, then we're toast. It has to mean impossible in chapter 6, verse 18. Chapter 10, verse 4, and this is really one of the key ones. It is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. It is impossible. Not happening. Okay. And then finally, Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. So my point here is, in Hebrews 6, it is the strongest possible term. He is saying, if you do not press on the maturity and you fall away, it is impossible for you to be restored to repentance. Cannot happen. Will not happen. Cannot, will not, who knows? Okay? The point is, it's not going to happen. Right? So he's trying to warn them in the strongest possible terms. And we, we like to shrink back from that. We like to kind of make it a little fuzzier than that. No, 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 surely. Surely some people can return. And he's saying, no, people who do this. Now we'll talk about what this is in a minute. Okay? But people who do this, and he's saying to the congregation, and you guys are drifting that way, people who do this don't come back. They fall away and they don't return. That's the way it works. All right. Let's talk a little bit about... Now, the basic sentence here is the beginning of chapter 4, or verse 4, sorry, and the beginning of verse 6. For it is impossible if they fall away to be renewed again to repentance. That's your sentence. Okay. And he throws in these sort of modifiers, if you will. Enlighten, taste the heavenly gift, become partakers of the Holy Spirit, taste the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Now, again, a lot of discussion. What is all this? What does all this mean? What is he talking about here? Okay. If you go back and you read Numbers and you read Deuteronomy and you read Nehemiah 9, which is kind of interesting, Nehemiah 9 connects to this. Nehemiah 9 is a confession of sin. And he's talking about Israel in the wilderness. And if you go back and you read about the wilderness and you read Deuteronomy, you see a lot of connections between the phrases in verses 4 and 5 and the wilderness wanderings. A lot of connections there. Similar language used. Similar, similar terminology used. And that shouldn't surprise us. Because back in chapter 3, he talked about the wilderness generation. And he said, listen, they didn't believe. And so they didn't go into the promised land. They didn't enter the rest. Okay? So there's connections there with the wilderness generation. And it's since he's saying, this wilderness generation, remember what happened to them? Their bodies fell in the wilderness. Their bodies fell in the wilderness. They did not come back. They did not repent. They did not get into the land. They died. Okay? And he's saying, the same will happen to you. If you get these gifts from God, that's what these are, and you, and you squander them, and you waste them. Okay? So what are these things he's talking about here? Enlightened, heavenly gift, partakers of the Holy Spirit, taste of the good word of God, and the powers of the age come. A lot of debate about what these are. I think it just basically means the life of the church. Baptism, the Lord's Supper, the preaching of the word, the prayers of the saints. That's what I think he means here. Now we can kind of parse out what each one means. Some people think enlightened is talking about baptism. There's a similar terminology in certain places. Taste of the heavenly gift. Obviously, people are like, oh, that's the Lord's Supper. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Partakers of the Holy Spirit, that could be the Lord's Supper and baptism together. Okay. One, one commentator said, it's not absolutely clear that it's baptism and the Lord's Supper, but it's also not absolutely clear that it's not baptism and the Lord's Supper. Okay. It's kind of a cop out, but it's true. It's hard to tell. <laughs> we don't really know. But I think what, what he's saying in verses 4 and 5 is you have come into the Spirit-filled body and you have tasted all the gifts of that Spirit-filled body. You've been baptized. You have eaten at the Lord's Supper. You pray. You hear the word preached. You have tasted the good word of God. Okay? And I think that's exactly what he means. I think he means preaching right there. Remember, we tend, to, we tend to look at this and go, yeah, he means reading the Bible. Well, guess how many people have Bibles to read in Hebrews? Well, not very many. Let's just put it that way. Maybe not. Okay. So it says tasted the good word of God. He's talking about the preached word. Okay? And the powers of the age to come. This is the new covenant age. 
the new covenant age. You've tasted all of this. You've come, and you're a part of this spirit-filled body. You interact with people every Sunday in this church and outside who are filled with the spirit, who have the third person of the Trinity living in them. Okay? So that's his idea. So I'm not sure all the specifics. You kind of hashed it out. The one I'm really pretty convinced of is the taste of the word of, good word of God is preaching. But outside of that, I would just say it's the life of the church. You've been brought into the life of the church. Okay? This person has been brought in. They've tasted all of these good things. Okay? The rain, to use the term in verses 7 and 8, the rain has come down. The rain has come down upon them over and over and over again. Someone can taste all of this and still fall away. Someone can be a partaker of the Holy Spirit, as described in this passage, and still fall away. The author is saying it is possible for someone to come in to the Spirit-filled body, to be baptized, to eat at the Lord's Supper, to hear the Word preached, to change, to grow, and still be destined for eternal damnation. Okay. Now, as a Calvinist, I'm a diehard Calvinist. I um, hope most of you are as well. This can be a little disconcerting. Okay? We're like, wow, how can that happen? How can someone be a partaker of the Holy Spirit and fall away? Okay? How can someone taste the heavenly gift and fall away? How can that happen? Okay? Well, the first thing I want to show you this morning based around this is that it's a regular teaching of the New Testament. It comes up over and over again in the New Testament. We look at Hebrews 6, we're like, wow, that's a difficult passage. That's kind of hard. Well, it is kind of hard. But there's lots of passages in the New Testament like this. So, for example, in Luke chapter 9, he, Jesus calls his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all the demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And then over in verse 6, so they departed and they went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So the twelve, including Judas, went out and they preached the gospel and they healed everywhere. Judas preached the gospel. Judas healed. Judas cast out demons. Judas did that. And Judas is now in hell. Matthew chapter 7, one that's probably a little more familiar with you, to you. Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied? Have we not cast out demons? Have we not done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you depart from me, you workers of iniquity. They prophesied. They cast out demons. They did signs and wonders. And they're damned eternally. How can that be? How can that be? All right, a couple other examples of this. Matthew 13, which Evan read there, uh, the sower and the seed. You got your four seeds, you remember this, or four uh, pieces of soil. And the first soil, the Satan comes and snatches it away. But the second and third receive the seed in some way. They take it in. Verse 20 says they receive it with joy, yet he has no root in himself. Verse 22, they receive the seed among thorns, and he hears the word, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. Okay? So the second and third soil receive the word. They're the people that come in. Oh, yes, I want to believe in Jesus. I want to trust in Jesus. And they come in, but ultimately they don't stick it out. Okay? They don't stick it out. Right? And then a couple other examples here. Uh, Acts 8, I won't read all that, but Acts 8, Simon Magnus, it says he believed and was baptized. And by the end of the chapter, and this seems like a pretty quick time frame. It's hard to tell in Acts always, but it seems like a pretty quick time frame. In Acts chapter 8, he believes and he's baptized, and at the end he's cast out. He believed and he was baptized, and now he is cast out. And then Galatians chapter 5. Verse 2, I'll start in verse 2. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. You have fallen from grace. If you try to be justified by the law, he's not saying you never had it. 
He doesn't say, oh, you weren't really a Christian. He says, you have fallen from grace. And there's lots of passages like that in the Bible. So what we have here is a, a passage, and it teaches exactly what, it, what you think it teaches. It teaches that people can come into the body, and they can partake of the gifts. They can grow. They can mature. They can preach. They can prophesy. They can do signs and wonders. They can build huge churches and ultimately not be saved in the full sense of the word and fall away. And we all know this from experience. Okay? This isn't, I mean, if you think about your life and you think about ministers, you think about people, I know men who the first 10 years of their ministry, they were great. First 10 years, they were great. And any book they wrote during that first 10 years, I'm like, yes, those are fantastic. Well, then, <laughs> last 10 years, you're like, well, it gets a little more sketchy. It keeps getting more and more sketchy and more and more sketchy. And all of a sudden, by the end of that 20-year span, they've completely renounced the faith. Completely renounced the faith. Now, they're still in the church, somehow, some way. But they're not Christians in any meaningful sense of the word. They have renounced the faith. What F.F. Bruce, the commentator, he says, Those who have shared in the covenant privilege of the people of God and then deliberately renounced them are the most difficult persons of all to reclaim for the faith. Those who have shared in the covenant privileges and deliberately renounced them are the most difficult of all to reclaim. And what comes to mind to me, and what comes to my mind is the Anglican Church in England. This week they just talked about, there was this whole article about them doing baptisms online. You get baptized online, take the Lord's Supper online. Okay? They've completely lost it. They have, they're, they're, they're not, they're completely apostate. And it doesn't matter how much you talk to them. It doesn't matter how much bad stuff, how many, church, how many members they lose. The church in England is completely apostate. And that doesn't mean not a couple of good Christians here and there. But overall, they're completely apostate. And this is, where, this is what they've done right here. This is the thing they've done. And the PCUSA in this country has done the exact same thing. So they have the name church. I mean, Presbyterian Church in the USA. It has the name church in it. That doesn't mean they're a church. They're dead. Okay. And people can do this too. All right. People can do this too. Now, it's important to understand here, he's not talking about normal everyday sanctification. All right. Normal everyday struggle with sin. He's not even talking about falling into deep sin. That's not what the author's talking about. He's talking about someone who deliberately renounces God, who turns their back on God through either atheism or something like that, or through gutting the Christian religion of everything that matters. That's what he's talking about. So if you struggle with sin... If you struggle with, you know, we all have our besetting sins. If you have those besetting sins, that doesn't put you in this category. Yeah. Just because you stumbled last week doesn't mean, oh, no, you're in Hebrews 6 and I'm on the edge of apostasy. <laughs> That's not what it's saying. All right? This is a very deep apostasy. But notice here, this congregation is there. He's not saying this because he's not worried. He's saying this because he is worried. He's concerned for them. He's concerned about their growth and their life. And he's saying... You need to watch out. Now, just the end of chapter, end of verse six. There, they crucify again. For, <clears throat> excuse me. They crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. They nail Jesus to the cross again. They're in, they're not in the crowd at Pentecost that says, "What must we do to be saved?" Or Peter, "What do we need to do?" And he says, "Repent, and be baptized." They're in the crowd on Good Friday who are chanting, "Crucify him, crucify him." They don't want Jesus. They want him dead. They want him gone. Okay. And open shame, it's an interesting little word. Um, it's used in Numbers 25. And Numbers 25 is where the women of Moab come and commit sexual immorality. You remember the story? Balaam tried to curse Israel. Try to remember, King of Moab takes Balaam all around all these mountains and tries to curse Israel. He can't do that. So Balaam eventually brings in women, which men tend to be stupid about. Okay? So it brings in women, and those women cause... Israel to commit sexual immorality. Well, the leaders of this, the Israelite leaders, Moses says, I want you to take those leaders out and I want you to hang them on a tree, kill them, hang them on a tree until sunset. So you kill them in the morning and they hang there all day in the hot sun until sunset. This word, put to open shame, is used in that passage. So that's the picture of what people want to do with Jesus. These ones who apostatize, and we all know this. If somebody... 
for years, they love Jesus and they're going to church and they're reading their Bible and they're evangelizing and they're doing all these great things. Then all of a sudden they change. And they don't like Christ anymore. And they don't love Jesus anymore. And they're not going to church anymore. What shame does that bring to the name of Christ? It's like, it's like a husband who said he loved his wife for years and years and years. Then all of a sudden he's like, well, no, I'm kind of done with you. I'm going to move on to somebody else. It's embarrassing and it's shameful. And that's what these people do to Jesus. They drag him out in the sun, hang him up from a tree and mock him. That's what the apostates did. And that's why it's such a terrible thing. That's what you, Can you come back from that? I don't think so. The passage says no. You cannot come back from that. So that's the picture of what these men are trying to do when they fall away from the faith. And then the passage ends, verses 7 and 8, with this picture of fruitfulness or lack thereof. And again, Deuteronomy, if you notice blessing in verse 7 and cursing in verse 8, Deuteronomy language. Okay? So again, covenant language here. Covenant language. The rain which drinks in the earth, which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it, the gifts of God, the blessings of God, the baptism, the word, the sacraments, the prayer, the fellowship of the saints. Drinks that in and bears herbs useful for those to whom it is cultivated. Receives the blessing of God. Bear fruit. Basic, basic principle here. Bear fruit. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Receive the gifts. Receive the gifts. Receive the gifts. No fruit. Little fruit. Little fruit. Receive the gifts. Little fruit. Guess what? You're good for nothing. Good to be burned. And that's where we read Ezekiel 15. Ezekiel 15 talks about this branch taken out and burned. And God says, that's what I'm going to do to Jerusalem. But Jerusalem has turned her back on me. And therefore, I'm going to take her out and I'm going to burn her. Okay? And the burning here is covenant language. It is one of the covenant curses. Right? Is that you're burned. Okay. So, process. Let's walk through this again. You've got to press on to maturity. We can't stay on the foundation. We can't lay the foundation again. We have to press on the maturity because if we don't, we will run the risk of falling away. And if we taste all of God's gifts and all of the cousin privileges and we fall away, guess what? You can't come back from that. There's no return. There's no re-entry. You know, like those freeway exits, you know, that you get off of. It's like no re-entry. There's no re-entry. You get off that and you're toast. You're done for. Okay. All right. I want to end with four, four particular things we need to remember this morning. Four particular things. First, we need to have a proper doctrine of the church. We need to have a proper doctrine of the church. Because the misunderstanding of this passage really fundamentally comes down to we don't understand what is happening here. Now, there's two errors we can make. The one error is that if you're not elect and you come into this body, you're like a big steel ball. Okay? Big steel ball that says N-E, not elect. Okay, and you roll in here and you might get baptized, you might take the sacraments, and you might do all that, but you just roll through and you're not elect, and nothing really happens to you, you don't really change, and then when eventually you roll out the door, you know, the NE ball rolling out the door, the not elect ball. Okay. Nothing happens, nothing changes. Well, that's not what we read in scripture. Judas did things. We know people who've done great works and have not been Christian in the long run. Okay? okay. So that's not an accurate description. The other problem you run into, though, is when you come into this body, you are saved. That is the other perspective. You come in here and you are saved. And there are people in our denomination who come perilously close to this particular interpretation, and it's bad. It's bad. Okay? It's got to be properly qualified. It usually isn't. Okay? You come in here and you're saved, and then you leave and you're unsaved. And you come back and you're saved. You leave and you're unsaved. And that's how it works. Basically, to be in the church is to be saved, and to be outside the church is not to be saved. Well, I would say to be outside the church is probably not to be saved. But being in the church is not a guarantee of salvation either. So we have to find a balance here between these two. And the balance is that when someone comes and is a part of a body, they get real, genuine grace, real, genuine blessing. All of us do. Everyone does. But that is not necessarily saving grace. It is not necessarily salvific grace. They can taste some of God's good gifts, but they do not have regeneration. They do not have the spirit in full measure. 
So if we're going to make sense of Hebrews 6 and John 10, John 10 says they can't snatch them out of my hand. If we're going to make sense of Hebrews 6 and John 10, then we have to have a proper doctrine of the church. And the doctrine of the church is there are real blessings here, but just because you're receiving those does not guarantee you that you are a Christian. Just because you're in this building and you've been baptized and you're hearing the word and you're tasting the good gift of God and the powers of the age to come does not guarantee your salvation. We are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. We're saved. So there's a balance here of recognizing that being in the body is full of good gifts, but it's not a guarantee of our salvation. That's, that's a whole sermon. I know it's a little sketchy, a lot, like not fully um, fleshed out there. But hopefully it gives you the perspective. That's the way I think the best way to handle passages like Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10, and John 10. And Ephesians 1. How do we bring election together with falling away? How do we bring those together? Well, what do they fall away from? Well, they fall away from the gifts and the blessings of the church, but they do not fall away from ultimate salvation. Okay. So, first we need to have a proper doctrine of the church. Second, and this flows directly from this, we are partakers of great covenant blessings. We are partakers of great covenant blessings. And a lot of times we, I don't know, maybe you don't think this, but I thought this, especially as a kid, how cool it would be to go back to the old covenant days. You know, wouldn't it be cool to go back with Moses and Elijah and Abraham? You know, life seems so dull here. You know, I mean, where's the Elijahs bringing out fire? Where's Abraham? You know, chasing Lot up in the hill. We could use a few. Now, where are these guys at? Okay, well, first that's a bad reading of the Old Testament. There were years and years and years and decades where nothing happened. Okay, first. But second of all, it is a disparaging of the great covenant blessings we have. We have Jesus in full measure, bright lights. We have the resurrection of Christ. It is all clear. It's like looking through a window that's all been smudged and you can see bits and pieces. And now with the coming of Jesus, it's all been wiped away. And we can see clearly. We have the great covenant blessings of Jesus Christ and this church, this spirit-filled body that we are a part of, that we are privileged to be a part of, the body that fills the world. Okay? You could go almost anywhere in this world and worship Jesus with a group of spirit-filled people. That is amazing. You can go into your house or your phone or whatever you carry around, and you can find Bibles, numerous translations, and you can read them and you can study them. We have so many covenant privileges, and this is part of the burden of the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is saying you have great covenant privileges, greater than the old covenant saints. Don't throw it away. Don't waste it. So second, we are partakers of great covenant blessings. Third, with covenant privileges come covenant responsibilities. Okay. With covenant privileges come covenant responsibilities. You've been given a lot. We have been given a lot as God's people in the new covenant age. And even in America, I mean, we have wealth and riches that I think our fathers in the faith would, would, would long for, would lust after, would covet. Oh man, if I could Luther, you imagine Luther, I could just type something and have millions of people read it. Oh my goodness, wouldn't that be awesome? Luther would love that. Okay? I mean, we'd love it. We have so many privileges. Do we take responsibility for those? What are we doing with what we have? That's basically what I'm saying. Jesus has given us so much. What are we doing with what we have? In a lot of ways, it's like, like a man who's inherited, we're like a man who's inherited something, like say a 5,000 square foot home. A huge home on a hill, a mansion on a hill. He inherits his mansion. Somebody asked him, have you gone to visit? No, no, I don't really worry too much about it. But you're living in a trailer park. Well, I know, I know, but I mean, I don't really care about that mansion. I don't really care about that inheritance. And for a lot of us, that's what it's like. We have this great inheritance in Jesus, in the word, in our fathers in the faith. We have this great inheritance, and we don't use it. So what are you doing with your covenant privileges? What are you doing with what God's given to you? How are you using it? And the fourth thing is we must press on to maturity. We must press on to maturity. The burden of these few verses is that the church that the writer of Hebrews is writing to has stagnated. They've become flat. They don't press on. They're content in a bad way with their Christian life. We have to press on to maturity. So I'm going to ask you, what areas are you working on in your life? 
And there's two things here, theologically and practically. What doctrines are you studying? Where are you growing? I need to study the atonement more. I need to study the Trinity more. I need to study Hebrews more. I need to study Revelation more. What are you studying? How are you growing? Are you just kind of flat? Oh, yeah, I'm going to read through the Bible again this year. Yeah, okay, that's good. That's good. That's not enough. We want to be pressing on to maturity. We want to be growing and maturing. And then what areas in your Christian life are you putting to death? What target, what sin have you targeted to deal with this year, to work on this year? Some of you think, well, Pastor Ben, I don't think I have any sins. To which I would say, ask me. I will tell you what your sins are. No. <laughs> ask your neighbor. Ask your friend. You've got some place you need to work on. Okay? There's a part of your spiritual house that's falling down that you need to work on. What is it? Is it lying? Is it cheating? Is it bitterness? Is it anger? Is it pride? Is it lust? Are you working on it? Are you just like, well, you know, I'm moving along. I show up at church. I take the Lord's Supper. I try to be a good person. I'm going to be fine. That's not going to do. That's not going to do. Okay? That will not work. And that's the point the writer of Hebrews is making. If you live that way, you will find yourself sitting in this spot where you have tasted all of this and you have turned your back on it. Turn your back on. So press on to maturity. Find something in God's word you want to study and study it and grow. And that's what he's about to do. He's about to take a, a trip down Melchizedek Lane. Okay, that's what's about to happen. It's going to blow our minds. All right? That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to study it. But then also practically, what are you doing? Where are you growing? Okay? You're just hoping it all works out? Well, guess what? It's not going to. Okay? You, God, Christ gave you the spirit for a reason. And the reason is that you might grow and you might mature. So, we need a proper doctrine of the church. We are partakers of great covenant blessings. Covenant blessings bring covenant responsibilities, and we must press on to maturity. Okay. Now, I want to end on a positive note. Verse 9, he's convinced of better things. I am convinced of better things for you. I love the way you guys are growing. I love the way you're maturing. I love to see what's happening in your homes and in your lives. Like this author, which I'll get to next week, verses 9, 10, 9 through 12, like this author, I am confident of better things concerning you. I'm encouraged by what I see. So my exhortation to you this morning would not be you're falling behind, get up, you're, you're terrible. My exhortation would be keep pressing on. Keep pushing forward. As a congregation, as individuals, you are growing. Keep doing that. Okay? And we will learn more about Jesus, and we will learn more about how to walk with him. And we'll have more delight in God and his word and more delight in each other as we do that. So I'm confident of better things for you. I'm confident of those things that accompany salvation. I'm really encouraged by the growth, so I didn't want to end on a negative note. I'm really encouraged by the growth that I see in our congregation. I encourage you guys to keep pressing on, find those places, and work on them. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do thank you that uh, our own salvation is, uh, to a large degree, a work of you by your spirit, through your word, and through your people. I ask that you would help us uh, to grow and to mature. I uh, thank you for the growth that we've seen as a congregation over our almost nine years here, the, the hard times, the good times, the bad times, the difficult times, the ways you have helped us. I pray that you would continue to help us to do that. I ask, Father in heaven, that you would keep us pressing on so hard, we become weary so easily. Um, we slack, we backslide, we plateau. We don't want to be like that, Lord. And we know only by your spirit, only by great dependence upon you, can we press forward. So we ask, Father in heaven, that you would give us strength and grace, that you would help us to lean upon you and to trust in you as we move forward. We also pray, Father, that you would uh, help us to recognize those around us who might be drifting this direction and be willing to give them the hard but gracious word that they need to be cautious and uh, they need to make sure they don't find, end up in the burn pile, make sure they don't end up in the uh, pile of the apostates. So we thank you again for your grace and mercy to us. We thank you for this passage. In Jesus' name, amen.